This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Here with me is my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Daily News. Director, choreographer, performer Tommy Toon has won nine Tony Awards for such classic Broadway musicals as My One and Only, Grand Hotel, Nine, my favorite show, and The Will Rogers Follies. Mr. Toon has a memoir out called Footnotes from Simon and & Schuster, and he has a brand new CD called Slow Dancing, and we are delighted tonight to be joined by Tommy Toon. Hi, Welcome thanks. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Now, uh, Tommy, you're not uh, um, uh, a wise old man of the theater yet. <laughs> what prompted you to look back on your life and write a memoir at, at this stage of the game? I broke my foot. In Busker Alley? Yeah, uh, one week before we t were to come in, in Tampa. We were coming in to start previews in New York at the St. James Theater, and in the last 30 seconds of, of that performance on a Sunday matinee, I slipped and I broke my foot. And the whole show collapsed. And I was laid up with a cast on my foot going nuts, because I was in the best physical shape I'd ever been in, dancing better than I'd ever danced, which is saying a lot at this age that I can say, but I mean it. Something happened on that show towards the end, and it, I, I don't know, something happened. And I had this accident. So I didn't have anything to do, and I was going nuts, and I was trying to sleep, and this voice, voices in my head, and one voice kept saying, I never had a grandfather, I never had a grandfather, I never had a grandfather. So I just rolled over in the middle of the night and wrote that down, and then that released me, and I was able to sleep. I woke up the next morning, and I went, what's that? Oh, I wrote that down last night. I never had a grandfather. One was crushed in a coal mine collapse when mom was four, and the other, after another hopeless day on the farm, shot all of his farmhands, shot grandma, and then himself. And that's how it started happening, and it just came out. I never thought about that. I'd never taken time, really, to think that I never had a grandfather. And then this, it just started pouring out. And it wasn't, I wasn't writing a book. I was just saving myself from a bad time, and I was feeling extreme guilt that 200 people had been put out of work because of you know, that one beat in the music class And of course, slipped. reading the columns, some of which I think I wrote about yes. Busker Alley and the problems in the here and there. And yeah, there was a lot of rumor going around. Well, I do want to deal, I, let, let's deal with some of those rumors as okay. long as we're on the subject of Busker Alley. Um, I don't think there was ever any doubt that you um, uh, broke your toe because Fran and Barry Weisler, your producers. I did not break my toe. Broke I broke your, my foot. Your foot. They were a running. little toe <laughs> I have broken and gone on. Yeah. A broken foot is another thing. And Fran and Barry Weisler were running around Broadway showing, actually showing us the x-rays yes. of the foot to yeah. prove that because there was much discussion about the insurance. And as you know, there was a lot of talk about uh, the show being in trouble, not it getting was, great reviews. It, it, was, was in trouble. it was in trouble for quite a long time. And then it got fixed. It got fixed in the last three engagements that we played. One was in Ohio, then we played Baltimore, and then we played Tampa, and it was, the show was going finally, and they stopped talking about, oh, we love your dancing. They said, oh, what a good show, and you can tell what people say. You How know. come it took that length of time to fix it? Because you had been out on the road for a while. Yeah, but, you know, trying to fix a show on the road is really hard, Michael, because you, you play a week, maybe two weeks, and then you're off to the next, and you don't have the time to sit and work like a nice four-week engagement, nice six-week engagement. We were doing shorter things. That and, well, I guess it starts with the director-choreographer, and we really had a first time director-choreographer doing a new show. He right. had done Grease and did a great job. And there's there a though, lot well, to deal with yeah. making up a new show. Did you have to take over the reins of that show at some point from Yeah, Jeff? I did. I did. That was painful for me and for him. Because we should explain to the viewers that you and Jeff have uh, been friends for a long, long time. And it's been your assistant I've on many him, shows. I've known him since he was 16. I met him in stock. Uh -huh. He was dancing in the chorus in stock. And we started trading tap steps. And then, you know, we just lasted. Our friendship and our professional relationship lasted. Are you guys still friends in the wake of all the trouble with Buster? No, Rally? it's sort of, we've changed. It's, really? Yeah. It's hard. They're, there are casualties that happen in this business because of feelings being hurt and intense love of the theater and things happen. But I think that can be repaired as soon as I'm in town long enough to, you know, <laughs> right. to make it work. I'd like that. Do you think, was Busker Alley 
by the time you, well, at the time you broke your foot. <clears throat> Was it on its way to becoming as good a show as the shows that you have done in the past that have gotten you so much fame and success? I don't know, because I was in it. I don't know. But we had professional people come down and look at it, and they told me good things. And I, it was feeling better. I felt like we were out of the woods, and I felt like we were brightening. We had two more numbers that we needed to fix, which we were planning to fix in the preview period in New York. And uh, it was getting good. And, and Philip had come in on it, Philip Osterman, who's my longtime um, working companion. And Peter Stone had come in to doctor the book, as he does. And the score was always wonderful, always wonderful. So we were getting there, and uh, the Weislers asked Crank Rich to come and look at it, and he was <laughs> very encouraging. He was, why are you laughing? <laughs> Is that true? Did he really? He did. He flew down. Rocco Landisman and, and Frank Rich came. To see it, yeah, and he How was very encouraging. How do you feel having Frank Rich there as your show doctor? It made me nervous. Oh, he wasn't the doctor. He just came to give his opinion to the Weislers because they are friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was encouraging. He encouraged them. He said, go for it. Do you know, by the way, that Frank Rich is now uh, advising a number of people on shows on Broadway? He was in to see the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, yeah? And offered his advice on that. And also, Sideshow, he made it known that he was pleased with that show. But I'm just curious about that for a minute because while well, Frank gave you some pretty good reviews over the years, he always kind of, I thought, elevated Michael Bennett a little bit in his estimation over you. Um, well, why in does his one have to go up to make the... I don't understand. Well, I'm just curious why to, are you comparing us? Well, I'm just curious to know your reaction to having Frank Rich hovering around. I mean, had, had you had any I was happy to have, to have the input because I never wanted to direct that show. If I'd wanted to direct that show and star in that show, I think I could have done it. That's a stupid position to take, though, because you don't know when you're up there stage center mm -hmm. how you're coming across. Right. You can do it in a movie sure, because you can look at the rushes or whatever they call it and you can fix it or a television show, but you can't do it in the theater. That magic thing of the edge of the stage in there and what changes when you get it all right up here and you think it's fabulous and you go out there and look at it and it's awful. And then you fix it and you come up and it doesn't feel right. You need someone that you can trust out front. And you trusted Frank Rich to <laughs> brush I up your Frank show? Rich no, wait a minute. He I'm wasn't. still a little stunned that Frank Rich was down there helping uh, give his opinion he, on Oscar you know, He loves the theater that. and he, he knows it. He devoted a, peer, a long period of his life to it, do you at night after night. You know. But do you think it's But a, he wasn't writing on it or anything. No, he no. just came in to see it as a favor to them, actually. I mean, he wasn't hired. Do you think it's appropriate for a journalist to, to cross that line from having to keep an industry that he has covered at arm's length and suddenly be brought in to advise people he may write about? Well, he wasn't writing then. Mm -hmm. He was no, longer the, he was no longer the critic, uh, the, the lead critic for the New York Times. Of course, he was still writing about Broadway in general in his column. He write, he's written a number of columns about Broadway. Mm -hmm. So, but he was not a critic. Was, yeah, you know, it's a different thing. Well, was his We're, was his advice sound? Is Frank is Frank good at? Well, listen, uh, I took the encouragement. You know, he was <laughs> smiling and he said, "Hey, terrific!" That's and great. I was happy to hear that. And um, any chance that you would uh, ever do Busker Alley again, or is it just tied up in litigation? Do you want to know company? the oddest thing? This very day, as I was going out to do these interviews, uh, I got I got served with a subpoena. For the, the, for the insurance company, Lloyd's of London, to appear at a hearing <laughs> about this very thing, my broken foot. So, I mean, it, they're still going on. They're yeah, still right. wrestling back and forth. And I don't know what the story is. Right. And I have to go in the midst of my big tour, my big book tour, pushing my album. I have to go to court <laughs> and tell my story once again about what happened. That Ooh, what is that? I have to get there with my notepad. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you let me know what your, what your court tell, is? I tell you everything I know. <laughs> and that, I don't think that I will reveal anything new to them, but yeah. I guess they want to hear it from the horse's mouth. What an unfortunate metaphor. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> I don't want to make this all about Buscarelli, uh, ancient history. Oh, Let good. Let's talk about Back to the book. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, so this pours out of you. Now, you weren't a writer before. Never. Did it just, I only the words wrote, just flow? I only wrote what I had to write to graduate from college. And that was, you know, you had in playwriting class, you had to write two plays, and they were god awful. And, I had to write my thesis and all of that stuff, and it was all awful, not good. Mm -hmm. And I certainly didn't set out to write a book because I'm not a writer. But it started pouring out, and after about eight months of writing it, it started to 
pile up and become something. And so I took a month off just to let the dam full up, fill up again, and then it poured forth. And I wrote for two solid months, and right to the end. Mm -hmm. And I, the day that I finished, I gave it to my assistant, to Tom Reedy, to type. He typed it, and I called Sam Cohn, my agent, and I said, I think I've written something that people might want to read. Would you read it? And I was so nervous to give it to someone to read. And that was on a Friday. On Saturday morning, he called me, and he said, I read it last night in one sitting and I think it's really something, and may I take it to the, um, the literary department at ICM. And he, he took me into C.S. to Newburgh on Monday, and on Tuesday it was sold to Michael Cord at Simon & Schuster, like that. Now that's, I was so lucky, because I know that wonderful books kick around from publisher to publisher sure, sure. and all. So I felt really you know, lucky that, that he wanted to publish it. In the writing of the book and looking back on your life, was there anything that maybe a number of things that you discovered about yourself that you have been more open with now? Because I've interviewed you before, and you've always been guarded about your personal life. But this is a very, very personal book. In I've fact, never been asked about my personal life in an interview. I really have not. People have always asked things about, well, do you think Frank Rich is a good idea to Dr. Trump? <laughs> it's always about the work. Where am I? It is all, because my work is much more right. interesting than my personal life. But again, I mean, it's a Broadway memoir with a little boudoir thrown in. That's it. <laughs> a little sex, and, a little and, sex. <laughs> and, do you know, to write, if, you, if you're going to write something like this, you have to, if you can get to the truth, mm -hmm. you need to write it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you lead up to the truth and then suddenly you cross your legs, then you are being coy, and I'm not coy. And it's, we're heading towards the end of the millennium. I don't think it's time to be coy. I think it's time to... If you can get to the truth to share it with someone, I think it's your obligation in this kind of book. Mm -hmm. This is nothing, there are things in this book that are secrets, things that I would not discuss with you on television, it's things I would not discuss with you over dinner or on the telephone. But on the subway. <laughs> I, felt, I felt in writing it that I was writing, and perhaps the per, and of course the person is reading, and there is a it came from here and it came down my arm and I wrote it. I wrote it by hand. And things came out, secret things, that I feel comfortable in your picking up and reading. Because then I am not even speaking to you, but there is some soul truth mm -hmm. part of me that's hopefully touching some soul truth part of you. And there is a response to the truth, I feel, that is undeniable. When you hear the truth, whether you like it or not, it rings, and, I, and I, I was really shocked at what I'd written. I didn't know that I was harboring certain feelings. I didn't know till I got it out. And then the thing about writing, which of course you know because you're a writer, but I don't know, is that once you write, you are forced to look and say, this is what I think. This is what I think. I've never taken time to do that. It's too busy putting on shows. So it was liberating for you in a way to truly, kind of think about your life that closely, that intensely? Yeah. And truly, I'm a different man having written it. I feel like, although I didn't know I had a cloud over me, I feel like whatever was there isn't there now. And Do you have any idea what that light. was, what the block was, or what the cloud things, was? Feelings about my father, that he didn't come through with that curtain. Remember mm -hmm. when I was doing the show in the backyard? Yes, that's right. And that he promised to bring that curtain, and he didn't? Just explain I'd, that story for, yeah. the, for the viewer. Oh, I always have put on shows. All my life I've put on shows. And with the neighborhood kids in the summer when dancing school shut down, I had to do something. So I put on shows with the neighborhood kids. And I asked my dad that I needed a curtain to make the show work, to make it flow properly. I needed an in one so we could change the sets and have something going in front. And then the curtain would go and we'd be in the new scene. And he kind of said, you know, that he could do that out at the shop. And um, the day came, and I thought that he would be bringing it. I thought I'd communicated it, that he would be bringing this curtain and help me hang it with turnbuckles and the two iron posts. And the, the show was ready to go, and the, he never arrived in, the, in our old green Pontiac. And I kept running out and waiting. And finally, Mom said, you better start the show anyway. And I, you know, I was, I can't because we don't have the curtain. You know, it's as important to me now as it was then. Right. And this was not unusual for your father then to... Well, I'd never asked him for a curtain before. Well, but to let you down and to not be there. It for was unusual. It was. Oh, was. Yeah, right, my right. dad was a great dad, and ah. my mom was a great mom. And, you know, 
I, I was speaking to a woman at a cocktail party the other night telling her about my book, and she works for another publishing company, and she said, well, I hope you had a miserable childhood because otherwise your book won't sell. And I said, <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> nobody's going to buy it because I didn't have a miserable childhood. I had quite a wonderful childhood, and I had parents who supported me yeah. in no, making my, good. you know, they loved it that I sang and danced. Now, in this book, you deal with your uh, sexuality, uh, uh, yes. your, your homosexuality. Yes, um, and my other sexuality. And you, well, your bisexuality, I There you go. Are yeah. you bisexual? Uh, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. I've, never had it, I've never felt it was terribly important to delineate between a man or a woman. It's about loving another human being. And I've been that way forever. Like I had little boyfriends in school and little girlfriends in school, and I loved Patricia Swansea, and I loved Jim Finley. And it had <laughs> nothing to do with sex. I just loved being with them. And, you know, there are innate things that we know in our hearts. We know that we're not supposed to hit somebody and make them bleed. That's bad. Mm -hmm. I thought that to love whoever I loved was good. It felt right, you know. So. I never learned that part about not hitting someone and making them believe. <laughs> yeah. That's why I became a, a colonist. Well, you, you, get, you get in your legs. <laughs> right. um, you, uh, is it that you never dealt with your sexuality publicly before because no one asked you? Or did you feel, this was private, I'm not going to deal with these issues, but now in the book I am? These are all things that I feel are appropriate to discuss in a memoir that aren't particularly appropriate to discuss on television. Because you don't know who's watching, you know children, people that don't want to know. And I, and I do, every time that I discuss something very intimate sexually, I do make a little warning and say, if you don't want to know about this part, skip to the story about that Josephine wonderful. Baker. That was because wonderful. I do believe that there are people that don't want to know that. You know, So why force that information on it? But if you are interested in that, it's, all it's there. part of me. Yeah, it's there. It's fairly graphic at times. Is it? <laughs> well, we, I understand you don't well, want to address... Well, I don't address, blaspheme, Michael. No, and I understand you don't want to necessarily address these things spe specifically on television. <laughs> but I am just curious to know why the sections on the graphic sexuality. Because I was reading the book and I thought, wow, this is why certainly Andy very Warhol interesting. Song. Well... <laughs> What does that Did you, tell Do you us want it to you? all be sweet or do you want some... No, it not. tells you that I'm a showman. The and sexuality part, yeah. Showing... Well, no, uh, uh, I know how to put on a show, and that's a show. That's a that's a dance. Do you know what I mean? This and there are true. all kinds of spices that right. you put there in to are. make a, a a stew. You just you don't you know. Read the book. For you that. need pepper. You need salt. A little touch of curry is nice every once in a while. And you know? if you hadn't put it in, we wouldn't have believed you. Well, I'm sure you, you know, know you are a man yeah. in show business. And well, <laughs> yeah, come on. Yeah, come you know. on. But I mean, it's not wasn't so deliberately Michael, calculated. I, I want to have sell books, a so I'll put some sex. <laughs> is this an exclusive? <laughs> 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 to hear him talk, you, you would think it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's fascinating, though, because you, you really have not discussed this stuff as personally as you do in this book. Well, of course before. not. I haven't had this forum. Yeah. A, a memoir is, a, is, is, another, is a new forum for me. You think I'm going to come on a radio show or a television show and blab about my sexuality <laughs> with no one asking? Excuse me, I just want to get something straight. And then blah. Right. Come on, it's, it's what's appropriate. It's, a, it's called appropriate behavior. <laughs> well, you have to read the book for the <laughs> juicy I'm telling you, if your Broadway career ever washes up, you have a good, uh, good career in writing pornography. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not graphic. Is it pornographic? <laughs> it's fascinating. Oh, well, I'm glad you're titillated. For Broadway people, like <laughs> myself. I just, I just, the only session that even raised my eyebrows was the Andy Warhol story. And so that's, I just want to say everybody. So, I don't think we can discuss that with no. on the camera. So, but I want to, I, let, let us move from your personal life to your work. Okay. Um, I am curious if you can tell, tell us how you, being a legendary Broadway director and choreographer, create a show. Can you sort of specifically take us through I don't know, um, maybe nine. And tell us what goes on in the mind of Tommy Toon that creates the great Tommy Toon seal that we all recognize in a Broadway show. Well, first of all, I just do it the only way I know how to do it. I do not try to do, dazzle you with my theatrics because I do it the only way, I tell the story the only way I know how to tell the story. Secondly, it is not my creation. I'm, I'm an interpretive artist. 
as a choreographer, I'm a creative artist. As a director, I'm an interpretive artist. Someone writes it. I can't direct air. So I peer into the material that's written and think, how can I bring this to the stage? What is, what is the best way that I can bring this? What is the only way that I can bring? Because if it's, if it's really right, it's inevitable. And once you get the ball rolling, the show starts to lead you, if it's any good. If you're wrong, it goes nowhere and it, and it dies, and I've had my flops. But if it's right, it starts leading you, and you don't have to impose yourself on it. You just have to give it what it needs. What do you want? How can I help you? Mm -hmm. It's the same way as painting, when I paint. Once the first stroke is made, the next stroke, is, it, it tells you what to do, mm -hmm. and the color, and the form. Now, I've heard that you, I had heard you were a painter, and also that you, you sketch a lot. Your, your I draw, images of the show, yeah, I the do. Set, the what is this like storyboard? I like storyboard. You storyboard a Broadway show. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. To keep it straight in my head, because there's so many images, because music, you know, sends you. So you gotta, you gotta hold it somehow in the planning stage. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't necessarily follow it once it gets on, but Will Rogers Follies, I pretty much storyboarded throughout the whole thing. Yeah. But a lot of shows come together. A lot of your shows, my one and only, I'm thinking of, and, and, and Grand Hotel, in that crunch time. I know. When you're out of town. And once you get back. Here, here's what happened. It was started with Seesaw. I had just returned to, I'd, I'd been dance, I danced in the chorus on Broadway, and then I went out and made some movies. And I was in, in England making a movie, and I returned. And Michael Bennett had given me his apartment to stay in because he was in Detroit. Uh, fixing up a show that was in trouble called Seesaw. I open the door, I'm schlepping my suitcases in, and I hear the phone ringing. This is before answering services. I ran, I said, Michael Bennett's apartment, and he said, you're there. And I said, yeah, I just walked in. He said, don't unpack. Go to the airport. Come to Detroit. I'm fixing a show. I need you. I'll pay you $500 a number. Wow. And off I went. I never got paid, but who cares, <laughs> because I got in the show. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that process on Seesaw, which was a disaster out of town, and he just kept working on it and got it on at zero hour, has somehow implanted itself in my life. And it seems that every show that I do is a disaster until at zero hour I find it. I do not. <laughs> I doesn't, wish it didn't work I mean, that doesn't way. That get you, doesn't that get you a little wearing on you? Doesn't it yes, tire you out after Yes, work? because I think when I go into rehearsal with the script, I think I've got it. You know, <laughs> I think this is it. And then it gets up there and you're, to you're always surprised. And that's the process. And the, the process for, I think, as a director is to go in every day with baby eyes. Baby eyes. Meaning, I'm sorry, baby eyes. Baby eyes. You've never seen it before. Oh. A little baby opens his eyes. Oh. That person comes out on stage, waves his arms, the girls start singing. Oh, what does that mean? That means he has power over those ladies. Oh, now they're getting up and they don't want to sing anymore. He's losing power. And I just keep going back and looking at it with baby eyes. That was, I was talking about nine, of course. Mm -hmm. But it, it's the baby eyes. If you think you've got it all and, and, and then you go in and you see what you want to see, then you've lost touch with it because it's an illusion and you're not, you're not connected to what the audience is. You have, and it's hard. One, you've been working and you've gotten on all the details of a piece of choreography, and then you go back and you try to see it. You can't see it. You have to come back the next day and look at it with baby eyes. Do you really like directing? Um, somebody told me that you weren't crazy about directing. It's something that I've always done, that I've been given, I keep being given the power to direct, we want you to direct this. Oh, but I'm the star show, yeah, but if you don't take over the show, then we're gonna close it, like what happened with my one and only. It's not anything that I went for. Really? I did not set out to be a director. I set out to dance in the course of a Broadway show. <laughs> I didn't know they, they came, you know, smaller than me. I didn't. Six foot six and a half does not a good course boy make, but what did I know? I mean, you know, I, I went to a kid from Texas. And I wanted to dance in the course of a Broadway so show. So almost in spite of yourself, you have become it a has great happened. Broadway director. It has happened. And I'm grateful. And I love it when I'm doing it. And there are times that I don't love it. When, you know, you get, well, you get once the show's up, the, the first pass through the show is wonderful, because it's just you and the actors. And then the people come in to look at it and then say, oh, no, you've got to start the second act this way. And you've got to, and you've got to. And you hear all that information. And, and then it's hard to, to keep 
stay true to the peace and yourself and what you believe is there and still please everybody else if you can. Now you I know. do want to ask you, you had really enormous success, one after the other with uh, Bessel of Whorehouse and Nine and uh, My One and Only, Grand Hotel, The Will Rogers Follies. There has been though the period for the last few years beginning I guess with the Best Little Whorehouse Goes Public which was a big big a flop, flop yeah. and the a problems with Busker Alley and Greece which you were involved in is a success it's a success and I don't mean to argue with success but the critics were not really crazy oh, about well, that well nobody's show. ever liked Greece yeah I mean but particularly your production the original, of Greece, the critics no, the, were read the original reviews of Greece no, it is the show that the critics love to hate and the audience loves to love and that's just the way it is and I don't listen Greece I don't get Greece right was this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but I know that it makes people extremely happy. It makes and them I the money love for everybody. That. Well, I love the money. <laughs> that's really nice. That's 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 the cream. Was that difficult for you to have had such success and then to have oh, such yeah, a come me, down? Let me tell you something that happened. In the midst, up until Greece, I had this amazing agent named Eric Shepard who was my guardian and the, the man behind the man and he created my whole career and he died of AIDS on my birthday mm. while we were in rehearsal for the Will Rogers Follies and nothing has really happened great for me since Eric's death in this business because he was such a uh, an incredible force and he did it with such love for me and the theater and he had an innate sense of what I was right for and he helped me with my choices and he was a great agent of the old school mm -hmm. who would say you will take seven percent of this show seven percent of something is better than ten percent of nothing do it like that so he would never ma let a let a deal let a deal breaker exist if it was something that I wanted to do and that he felt that I was right for. Mm. And I have been at sea without Eric. I, I've been at sea without him. Because one needs, an artist needs that kind of guidance in the marketplace. Because I'm not a businessman at all. Not at all. I have not written a check in 30 years. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I, I literally do not know how to do that. I'll teach you. You can write one out to me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you say you're at sea, you're starting a new project yes. down in Australia, Easter Parade, yes. got the rights to great Berlin songs. You're going to star and direct it, star in it and direct it with... Uh, Co-direct it. Co-direct it. With Philip, yes. With Philip Osterman, your friend. Do you feel that you are finally pulling yourself out of being I at sea? I hope so, otherwise I wouldn't be wasting people's time and money. I hope so. I, I think it's a good project. I, it's been a long, long time since we've had Irving Berlin music on Broadway, and it is great music. I mean, oh, his, his, his catalog is just astounding, what this man wrote. And it's, they're real show tunes because they have a lot of energy. They hit the back. You can do them without Mike. There's you a know, lot of there's, there's a lot of that. excitement about the show, and I'm wondering if, if if you would agree with this. It's because people say Tommy has finally found a project that really suits his talents, that a great old-fashioned musical comedy with the light touch, things that people thought were missing in the Best Little Whorehouse Goes Public and uh, in Greece, and maybe perhaps in Busker Alley. Do you agree with that? Are you comfortable more comfortable with this kind of material, the old-fashioned MGM musical stuff, than you have been with well, recent things you've done? Oh, it's so hard for, to, to sort of compare the music of Irving Berlin to the music that we have had in these other shows that you're mentioning. I love the music in Busker Alley. Let me be very clear. That was a wonderful score. Our problem with Busker Alley was the book. Right. It was not a story that anybody wanted to see. They just didn't, were not interested in that story. And so we were, we had moved it around so it was something that people could pull for. You know, right. someone.